Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Library and Archives Lunch Hour on Helen Rodriguez Trias and the Fight Against Forced Sterilization. Um, today, we're joined by Dr. Felicia Hornblow, who is a writer, activist, and professor who specializes in the histories of feminism, gender, social welfare, and reproductive politics. She is they are professor of history and gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and affiliated faculty member in Jewish studies at the University of Vermont. She is the author or co-author of three books, including A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and The Journey from Rep Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice, the paperback edition of which is available now. Cornblow writes regularly for the scholarly and popular press, including The American Prospect, The Washington Post, and Time.com, Vermont Digger, and The Forward, and is a former member of the Vermont Commission on Women and President of the United Academics, the University of Vermont Faculty Union. They serve at present as Vice President of the Board of Planned Parenthood of Vermont Action Fund, as an editorial board member of the Journal of American Constitutional History and Disability Studies Quarterly, and as a member of the board of the Center for LGBTQ Studies at the City University of New York. Welcome, Felicia. Oh, wait, there we go. I take that back. I just said I can't undo the uh, video mute, but that was not true. So hi, and thank you so, so much. Um, <clears throat> First, I, I want to thank Centro so much for the for the archives and support. Um, and also Dr. Rodriguez Trias's family. And I wonder, is um is Joelle in here? Joelle and Brendan Rodriguez? Um and if so, can you unmute? Maybe not. Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to say a quick word? Introduce yourself or anything you want to say? And just a hello and glad to be able to be here. I'm holding my little grandson who's asleep on me right now. Uh, so I'm hoping he doesn't wake up during the during your talk. But I'm really happy to be here and see, you know, mom's contribution to this um, ongoing struggle um, put forward and what we can learn from it. Well, thank you. And thank you for everything you did to make the... Um the archives available also through um, through Centro. All right, I'm going to share my screen and I will um, go as quickly as I can, um, being aware of what was said in the video about not speaking too fast, which is hard for me. Um, okay. Um, so the book, the book that I published a year ago um, was already mentioned. Um, I'll go right here. So the book is A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. And um, I do write about my mother, my late mother, um, Beatrice Cogan Cornblue Braun, um, who was a, an activist for abortion rights, for legal abortion, um, and our neighbor, um, was Dr. Rodriguez Trias um, for about a decade. She lived across the hall from my family on uh, on West End Avenue in Manhattan. And um, so I won't say very much about this today, but I do write in the book about the, what we sometimes call the reproductive rights side of the of the struggle or the politics which is mostly about contraception and abortion rights or what we think of as the, the ability that people have, um, that people should have um, to make decisions about not to have children when that's an appropriate choice for them or that's what they want. Um, and then the other side of the coin, which is often referred to as reproductive justice today, which is, um, a much bigger kind of agenda, sort of an aspirational agenda that would include everything that people would need to make decisions uh, not to have kids when that's appropriate for them, but also everything they would need to have kids, to make, to make a really free choice about when it's appropriate for them to have children. And what I found was that it was Dr. Rodriguez Trias and, um, 
uh, yeah, I'm gonna open, I'm gonna uh, make that a little bit bigger. And her allies, especially in these um, two organizations, I focused on CESA on the one hand, um, which was formed in the middle 1970s, and CARASA, which was formed at the end of the 1970s, which laid the groundwork for what today is called the reproductive justice movement. And they, um, I, what I, the way I put it here was that they had a broad agenda that went beyond uh, demanding contraception and abortion um, and went to everything that people might need um, to bear children and to raise children when that's their choice. I um, mean, what I found was that Rodriguez Trias and her allies had this other term that they used. They, they talked about reproductive freedom, um, but that essentially they were they were getting at the same thing and that they really laid the groundwork for what um, is today still the cutting edge in the world of reproductive um, reproductive rights, justice, and healthcare, um, it, politically and also academically. So who was Rodriguez Trias? Um, <clears throat> uh, she was a physician. She was uh, born on the island of Puerto Rico and raised in New York City. Um, and then she went to school, to college in San Juan. But while she was there, had a political awakening as a nationalist and independentist. Um, calling for the independence of Puerto Rico from the United States. And so then she returned to New York City. I just, <laughs> I did a very thumbnail kind of um, summary here in the first part, in the first bullet point. Um, and then later went back to San Juan and finished college and uh, her medical training and became really a leading neonatologist at the University of Puerto Rico Hospital um, in Rio Piedras. Um, and, uh, and after, an enormous success there returned to New York City. Um, and that's um, that's where I pick up a more detailed story of the work she did. Um, I think it's very important to remember um, that her political starting points really were um, anti-imperialist and Puerto Rican uh, nationalist and independentist. And that her, um, a lot of her closest allies were the women of the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, the PSP. Um, and one um, one person I interviewed referred to her as basically a, a quote unquote fellow traveler in the PSP, probably not a member of the party, but very, very close. Um, and uh, in New York, Rodriguez Trias was, um, was traveling in uh, both um, white feminist circles and um, among a lot of the people who who founded the women's health movement coming out of the women's liberation movement um, and also the women's uh, women's group, the women's um, caucus within the PSP. And those were her two starting points. And I think that, you know, when we think about the history of feminism and repro, um, re reproductive rights and politics in the US, we never talk about it being connected to anti-imperialist struggles or having learned anything from anti-imperialist struggles or Puerto Rican struggles. And I think that's really important. Um, so yeah, and this is what I said at the end, that there's a kind of interaction, um, at least as I see it, between the anti-imperialist politics and the reproductive rights oriented feminism that was on the US mainland and in, in cities like New York. Um, and even in the, um, I think Rodriguez Trias was, was kind of sympathetic to the fight to legalize abortion, which was a very big fight um, in New York and elsewhere um, in the U.S. at that time, and um, and was deeply committed to uh, Puerto Rican independence and nationalism. Um, these are images from uh, Centra's archives. Um, this is Rodriguez Trias um, as a doctor at Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, um, and this is um, the the platform. Here, uh, maybe I'll make it a little bigger. Um, eh, you may not be able to read it super well. Alicia, uh, yeah. is it possible to hit present? Um, present. Um, um, maybe on one of the bottom corners. Bottom corners. Mm. Uh, um, let's see, I don't see it. Um, it's that, that, um, bottom next to next where you were zooming in and out okay got it I there know. that's what you that's what you mean right yes yeah Thank okay you. yeah sure um so here we go so that's a little bit bigger so this is the th this is one of the versions of the the program 
of the Young Lords Party um, from when they took over a part of Lincoln Hospital. So as it happened, when Rodriguez Trias returned to the mainland, returned to New York, um, she became the head of the pediatrics department at uh, Lincoln, which was probably the most politicized hospital in New York, um, maybe in the whole country. And, um, and the Young Lords had recently occupied a portion of the hospital demanding that it be more responsive to the, um, the Puerto Rican and black community members there. So um, yeah, so they demanded uh, what they called community control of healthcare in general, and particularly of this hospital, which was um, the local neighborhood hospital in the South Bronx, you know, one of the most Puerto Rican neighborhoods in the country. Um, and one of the things that they identified at this hospital, the Young Lords Party identified was sterilization and abuse. Uh, they 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 thought that people were being um, coerced or uh, influenced into um, having sterilization procedures that they didn't really want um, and that might not have really been appropriate for them. Um, so Rodriguez Trias's own political sympathies kind of leaned more to the PSP than to the Young Lords. The Young Lords were a little younger and more oriented toward um, the mainland than toward the island. Um, but certainly she was very influenced by the intense political environment at Lincoln Hospital when she showed up there. And, and she was she was brought in to be the first Puerto Rican woman department head at this hospital, in part because there had been this major uprising um, and, uh, and the young lords had demanded that the hospital be, you know, more responsive and more culturally appropriate and, um, and focus on the community needs. Um, so this is her, I believe, from the time when she was the, the director of pediatrics at, um, at Lincoln. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and you can see, if you can read it a little bit, that the, that the young lords, they have, you know, in general, they have a nationalist agenda um, uh, but it's an agenda that ultimately also includes um, issues of uh, reproductive rights and what today we would call reproductive justice um, through the, the fight against sterilization abuse. Okay, so with that background, those many different kinds of background, Rodriguez Trias and um, many of her allies in the PSP and also a group of uh, white leftist feminists they come together in the middle of the 1970s and they create uh, a brand new political organization, the first in US history that is dedicated to fighting sterilization abuse. So that's CESA, the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse. And um, this, is, um, this is a photo that I got from one of Rodriguez Trias's friends and allies. Um, uh, it was a group of mostly, it was a small group, but it was mostly um, PSP members, um, women from the PSP, and um, and white leftists, um, um, women and men um, with left wing commitments, anti imperialist commitments, and they started to link concerns about sterilization abuse in Puerto Rico, um, which people saw as um, part of the legacy of or the fact of U.S. colonialism. Um, with what they were seeing on the mainland in um, in hospitals like Lincoln Hospital and other um, of the public hospitals in New York City. And they had a series of kind of amazing successes that, um, again, are, are mostly forgotten in our histories of reproductive rights and justice. Um, so first, um, working within the New York City public hospital system, they got that system, the Health and Hospitals Corporation, to change its guidelines for uh, consent to sterilization so that people could not as easily be um, coerced or pressured um, in the moment, right, into agreeing to a sterilization procedure. I mean, doctors would say things like, you know, they would sort of suggest without maybe saying overtly, um, uh, you know, maybe you'll lose your welfare, you'll lose your Medicaid if you don't agree to the sterilization procedure, or they would sort of lie or fib and suggest to people that they could have a sterilization procedure and that maybe it was reversible, which it almost always was not, um, that kind of stuff. Um, they saw all of that as, as forms of sterilization abuse. Um, and uh, so their first big success was within the hospital corporation. Um, and then they went to the New York City Council and they had a huge success there too. 
um, and got the the city council to um, to agree to improved or heightened sterilization um, consent procedures for the whole city, every healthcare um, institution in the city. And really interestingly, their main opponents, the people on the other side of the debate, were the majority white feminist organizations, um, groups like the National Organization for Women and Planned Parenthood, um, which were working with this other group called the Association for Voluntary Sterilization. Um, the New York City chapter of NOW changed its position during this, the battle in the city council and they actually supported these new sterilization guidelines. But at the national level, the National Organization for Women um, continued to be opposed. And it was a really kind of um, bitter but also forgotten debate inside the reproductive rights or, uh, or mainstream feminist movement. Um, and I just wanted to underline, um, these are from um, Central Archives, Centro has um, on, uh, on microfilm the archives of Claridad, which was the PSP newspaper. Um, and these are just a couple of images, historical images from, uh, from the struggle against uh, sterilization abuse as it was as it was recorded in Claridad. Um, you can sort of see there um, the headline and then the, the photo on the inside. Um, Nope, let's see. There we go. Um, oh wait, one more, there we go. Um, in the late 1970s, um, on the kind of foundation that CESA had built, um, activists created a, a larger norm, um, a larger organization with more members called the, the coalition or the committee for abortion rights and against sterilization abuse or CARASA. Um, and Rodriguez Trias was one of the founding members um, and so were some of the other CESA members, although the PSP itself kind of as an institutional body had, had backed off from, um, from doing this kind of political work. Um, and then there were a lot of other um, feminists, mostly white um, socialists and radical feminists. And this was really the first time that the issue of abortion rights and the issue of sterilization abuse had been joined together and it was Carasa that defined this, this idea, which I think is so important historically and, and that we're still um, fighting for in the movement on this idea of reproductive freedom. And they said, um, people who can get pregnant must have, quote, the possibility of controlling for themselves in a real and practical way that is free from economic, social, or legal coercion whether and under what conditions they will have children. So it's very much like what people call for today when they call for a big agenda of reproductive justice, um, right? But this is going back to the late 1970s, early 80s. Um, Carasa said there were two sides to the issue of what they called reproduction control, um, restrictions on people's opportunities to have children and restrictions on people's ability to not have children when that was their choice. So Rodriguez Trias was involved in, uh, in, in formulating this larger agenda. Um, and finally, I'll just say very quickly, Rodriguez, this is, and this is also a photo from Centra's uh, collections, um, Rodriguez Trias continued to have a very distinguished and uh, really important career in, in public health and in women's rights. Um, and just a couple of the things that she did, um, first she was the first Latina ever to be the president of the American Public Health Association, a national um, leading organization. And then as the past president of the American Public Health Association, she advised the US government and then uh, was a representative at this critical global conference on population policy that happened in Cairo in 1994, which was really the first time um, that a feminist and an anti-imperialist um, position was represented in uh, one of these global meetings about population um, and the fight against sterilization abuse in the U.S. and, you know, in New York City and elsewhere um, on the U.S. mainland, as well as in Puerto Rico, um, that was really the foundation for what ultimately was a global fight against what was called population control, the use of sterilization um, and sterilization abuse um, and other kind of coercive measures to lower populations, especially in countries that were low income and um, majority non-white. 
Um, in a recognition of her work, she was awarded the Presidential Citizens Medal in 2001 by President Bill Clinton shortly before he left office. And then um, sadly she had uh, lung cancer and died later that year. Um, and the last thing I'll say, um, and this I, I'm hoping maybe um, some people get um, inspired by this, is that in uh, 2019, it was announced by Mayor de Blasio um, and the former uh, first lady of New York City, um, Charlene McRae, that she would be honored with a statue in St. Mary's Park in the Bronx. Um, and uh, I don't know what's happened with that initiative. And I, I'm hoping very much that the city of New York gets that back on track and that there will be a statue honoring her and her career in the city of New York. Um, and with that, we can uh, take uh, questions and comments. Thank you so much, Felicia. Um, we actually have two questions. Um, Joe is actually asking, can you comment on lessons learned from those early struggles on today's issues? Yeah. Um, well, so I, you know, the book, it's a little hard for me because the book is sort of structured around my mother's story. My mother was an abortion rights uh, activist and Rodriguez Trias's story. And um, I think uh, Rodriguez Trias kind of had the politics right. And to some degree, my mom um, had the um, um, had the politics wrong. Um, so I, I actually think that it's um, it's just critically important that we take on the issue of reproductive freedom, or what we sometimes today call reproductive justice. So fighting, you know, as much as as many resources, as much money, as many personnel as should be involved in. Um, you know, the fight to um, to keep uh, abortion access available to people. I think we need just as many resources to make sure that we don't go back um, to a situation where there's mass sterilization abuse there, the way there was in the 60s and 70s. Um, and so that we can really ensure that people have, that people have really meaningful options, you know, and that means, you know, national health insurance, not just, you um, not just abortion care, not just legal abortion, but we really, we need to make sure that people have access to all kinds of healthcare, prenatal and postnatal care. And, um, you know, and we probably need um, some kind of massive program of economic redistribution in order to make sure that people are gonna have um, the resources they need to really make free choices about when they're gonna have kids and whether they're gonna have kids and under what circumstances, you know, making sure that they're, they're free from domestic violence, um, that was another issue that Rodriguez Trias um, addressed uh, domestic violence as a public health crisis. Um, so I think we need we need the big agenda that I think she stood for, um, and and we need it. You know, we need it today just as much as we've as we've ever needed it. Great. And speaking of of that, can you speak a little bit more about Lincoln Hospital and what was going on at the time? both of the young lords take over for those days, but also when Helen uh, was hired and everything that came, the, the political turmoil also internally that came with that. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, some people might know or might remember, um, it was just a really terrible hospital <laughs> um, in terms of staffing, you know, numbers of staff um, and in terms of, um, in terms of physical plant. And the city of New York had promised to build a new hospital, but it had been something like 15 years since that promise was made and, and the ground had not yet been broken. The foundation had not been laid for any new hospital building. Um, and so the so the young lords were, you know, were demanding a change. They were demanding that the city um, be good um, to its promises. But I think they were they were also just critiquing the way that healthcare was delivered, you know, in New York and in America, um, all these hospitals um, had, and I guess still have, um, arrangements with uh, uh, medical schools, with some of the elite medical schools. And so what they saw is that there was an emphasis on research instead of an emphasis on, you know, providing people with primary care um, and especially neighborhood-based primary care. So what they were trying to do when they said community control of the hospitals, right? Um, what they were trying to do was provide basic, you know, community appropriate healthcare. They went out in a truck and tested people for TB. You know, they um, they 
uh, tried to reduce the wait times where people would be waiting with their kids, you know, to see a doctor. They they um, put in the first child care center um, in the hospital so that people, you know, would would be able to make sure that their kids were taken care of while they were while they were waiting. I mean, it was it was stuff that was deeply uh, fundamental, but it was a huge challenge to the way healthcare was uh, was delivered. And then um, it kept going on. There, there also was a movement among the doctors to try and provide and sort of innovate a new kind of of healthcare that would be responsive to the community and would be political. Um, I mean, this is another kind of forgotten thing: is that there were a lot of radical doctors, <laughs> a lot you know, radical health um, professionals who were trying to trying to rethink the way healthcare was delivered and and what hospitals were going to uh, be and what they were going to be for. And when Rodriguez Trias, you know, started working there, I think it was really hard. <laughs> it was really hard to be the chair of a hospital department with all these like young, junior, idealistic doctors working with her, you know, working under her supervision. Um, and they didn't like hierarchy and they, you know, they, they wanted things to change in a hurry. Um, so, um, but it was like, it was, it was a, it was a very important effort, you know, to rethink healthcare in a fundamental way. And the sterilization abuse fight was, you know, was one piece of that. Um, but it was, but, but there actually was a whole agenda about transforming healthcare that I, I think we also need to remember today. Um, we also have another question. Is there a support group or organizations providing services or resources for those who were coerced or forced into, into sterilization? My grandma sadly is a victim of this. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know in New York, you know, in California um, and uh, in North Carolina and a couple other places, um, there's been, there have been court cases and like California has a reparations program, a financial reparations program for people who are in the um, in the state uh, prison who were sterilized against their will. Um, and then an earlier generation of people who were sterilized under a state eugenics program, North Carolina under the state eugenics program. So I know that people there have organized and worked together and, um, and they got in the state to provide some financing. I don't know about New York. Um, I really don't know. So somebody else might know. Speaking of which, can you talk about how um, people in other parts of the country, other groups of Latinos or of Black women or poor women were incentivized by CESA's successes? Yeah, so um, basically every place in the U.S. where there was a big um, Puerto Rican community um, organized something like a CESA chapter. Some of them were called CESA, some of them had other names. Um, but you know, in Chicago, in Hartford, Connecticut, um, in the um, in the Amherst Valley, in Massachusetts, um, there were organizations, and there also were. And I I don't know. Uh, I mean, I sort of see it all um, happening at the same time. So I don't know whether people were watching CESA or whether they, you know, whether it was more coincidence in some cases. But like in LA, there was an anti sterilization movement that was part of the. Um, the Mexican American fight in LA. Um, and there was a very important court case, the Madrigal case against the um, the USC, the University of Southern California affiliated um, hospital in LA County um, uh, in, um, on reservation. Um, there was a scandal in the Indian Health Service because people were being coerced into sterilization and there were congressional hearings and it was part of the um, a Native American feminist group called Women of All Red Nations or WARN, and they made the sterilization abuse problem kind of the centerpiece, uh, one centerpiece of their politics. Um, so it was really happening in a lot of different places. And there were, there were Black women, especially in the South, um, who were talking about, even earlier, talking about what they called the quote unquote Mississippi appendectomy, right? Like Fannie Lou Hamer, the civil rights leader, um, uh, one of one of the stories about how she got into politics was that she went into the hospital in the I think fifties uh, um, for a benign um, cyst or something, and she came out and her doctor said, "Oh, by the way, we give you a hysterectomy," um, mm -hmm. you know, because there was some kind of idea on the part of some medical professionals that there were that certain women should not be having kids or should not be having any more kids than they already had. So it was like 
it was happening all over the country and everywhere that it was happening, at least as I understand it, there were by the late seventies, early eighties, there were people organizing and uh, and pushing back. Right, right. Um, let me see, we have one, one more question. And before that, I do wanna comment because something that you talk a lot about in the book, and of course, part of CESA's campaign was about these consent guidelines because oftentimes when we hear about forced sterilization, we only think that people we're either, told, we're either going in for a certain procedure, getting a hysterectomy, or where uh, the consent was given by the husband but while they were under anesthesia. But sometimes people were given consent. It was just the the uh, the situation under which they were given consent. People who didn't speak English, people who couldn't read a consent form as well. People, like you mentioned, who were told it was reversible. A, or that they were going to lose their welfare and things like that. So that's something very important to consider, I think, in, in these stories, that the way that it was done, a, it was in plain sight, right? A, and that's part of what says I was trying to fight with the guidelines. Um, yeah, and I think I mean, the, the one of the things that I really learned from kind of, you know, um, intellectually is about how they how they understood it as a spectrum. You know, there's the really... Um, overt case of Fannie Lou Hamer, right? It's like, oh, we gave you a hysterectomy that you didn't want. You know, that's like, but that, I mean, that was the, you know, the most egregious, horrible thing that could happen. And that was only one piece of the story is what they were trying to say, right? Is that there's a big spectrum and then there are all these other, in, you know, instances where people are pressured, coerced, where it's kind of suggestive, the doctor implies, you know, um, and and it was a way to to um, to think about um, how power works. I think you know how power works, how um, race and class um, interact with medicine. Um, and I think that's really deep, you know. And and it's all the way the spectrum also goes to. And, and Rodriguez Trias, you know, said this all the time in speeches. The the coercion also is economic coercion. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't afford, if you live in an unsafe neighborhood and the, you're subject to police violence, or you're, you know. Um, you don't have enough money to raise children, that can be a form of coercion as well. Exactly. Yeah. It, we also have a question here at back, going back to Lincoln Hospital. Can you speak of the fight to fire Dr. Silva, the head of Lincoln Hospital uh, a department? He was the proponent of sterilization abuse in Puerto Rico, leading to more than 30% of women being sterilized. Yeah, that's right. I don't know that I have a lot to add, but that was that was also part of the Part of the struggle, it was kind of, um, <clears throat> as I understand it, it was like an incredible offense right in the middle of this <laughs> struggle. And the people have been, you know, you know, talking about how this hospital had to be community responsive and, um, you know, and sterilization abuse was part of that, part of the problem. And then, you know, what do they do <laughs> in the leadership of the hospital in the city of New York is they decide they're going to bring somebody from, you um, from from Puerto Rico, who's you know who's notorious, right, mm -hmm. for being um, uh, for being a supporter of mass sterilization. So yes, the the PSP and the Young Lords went nuts um, over that. Speaking of the Young Lords, and and we saw that with the Black Panthers as well, where they were anti-abortion, eh, and then they changed the stance. Eh, partly because of the the women's committee right can you talk more about how how this this um transition from being anti-abortion to a more recognition of reproductive rights say, and the ability of women to choose yeah yeah so interesting um uh I, I you know in the young within the young large party and within the PSP too like there was a lot of learning and the women, um, probably some of whom are here, I hope, uh, the women who are involved, you know, they, um, you know, they they were learning from what was going on in the mainstream feminist uh, scene, um, politics, and uh, within their own, you know, nationalist um, organizations, and they, you know, they influenced the agenda, they changed the agenda. So initially, abortion itself was seen as um, evidence of imperialism, right? That it was another form of quote-unquote genocide, kind of like sterilization abuse. But they got to a place 
uh, where um, within the Young Lords, they were saying, okay, abortion's under community control. They were still demanding community control that people would have some choice and that healthcare institutions would be responsive to what people really need. Um, and they saw that, you know, that abortion under certain circumstances, you know, if people aren't pushed into it, that that could be, you know, part of somebody's um, somebody's human dignity to to, to make that choice, um, and not just a not just a part of quote unquote genocide or um, or imperialism. Exactly. Um, so we have five minutes left. I don't know if you had any closing um, a thoughts that you wanted to end with. Um, well, um, I did see that. Um, that Ana Maria uh, Garcia is here. And um, there is a, there's this documentary called La Operacion that people might be interested in. Um, and Rodriguez Trias is, is in that. Um, uh, and uh, um, I think it's uh, pretty widely available though people can, um, uh, can say in the chat if that's not the case. Um, there also is a film about the California case if people are interested. Um, uh, which is one of our most recent, um, you know, kind of big sterilization abuse scandals. Um, I guess maybe, oh, Belly of the Beast, somebody reminded me that that's what it's called, Belly of the Beast. Um, maybe I just wanna um, end by saying, you know, um, I work a lot today in uh, the reproductive rights area, and I know that people are very freaked out about the overturning of Roe versus Wade and the status of legal abortion. Um, uh, and of course that's important. And I understand, pe you know, people are running around like, you know, really desperate to change that situation. And I think that is, a, it is a matter of reproductive justice, right? To maintain um, legal abortion or to restore legal access to abortion in certain places. But I just so much, um, maybe I don't have to say that to the, <laughs> to the people who are here, but I just so much don't want to lose the rest of the reproductive justice agenda. I, um, I think it's so important. And when we talk about sterilization abuse, it's like the most literal way um, that somebody could be denied uh, real uh, freedom in the area of reproduction, you know, for somebody biologically to, to lose the ability to choose to have a child. Um, but I think uh, we learned so much from Cezanne Carasa and from Rodriguez Trias about um, how you build from there to thinking really broadly about all the ways in which people can be deprived of meaningful choice and dignity in their reproductive lives. And it is it is not just about abortion. It is so not just about abortion. Um, and it's not even just about abortion and sterilization abuse, right? It really goes beyond to that, um, to that big spectrum. Well, thank you so much, Felicia, for sharing um, Helen's story with us. And thank you, Joe Ellen, for joining us as well. Uh, thank you, everybody that was here. And we'll end right now. Uh, and I hope everybody has a nice day.